everyone. Uh, hope everyone's doing well tonight. Uh, so we're gonna um, have a conversation about a rather complex uh, condition. I have to say one of the most complex uh, diseases within the scope of uh, rheumatology, systemic uh, lupus, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, that's the full name of the condition. Um, most people know it as simply as lupus. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm just going to kick it off. So what is systemic lupus erythematosus? Um, it's a chronic uh, autoimmune condition. We don't know what causes it. We don't know what triggers the um, onset of the of this disease, um, but it is uh, it can manifest uh, within any organ uh, uh, in our body. Uh, so it's quite complex, uh, can vary in its uh, severity. Um, there's various uh, immunologic abnormalities. Um, there's a production of various uh, autoantibodies called anti-nuclear antibodies. Um, and they, they happen to uh, be present essentially in everyone um, who is diagnosed with lupus. So let's talk about uh, some of the uh, presenting uh, signs and symptoms of this condition. Um, now don't get uh, blown away by this slide with about to show on the screen, but it is it's quite, quite extensive. Uh, and that kind of goes back to what I mentioned in the introduction, that this condition can essentially affect uh, virtually every, every organ in our body. Um, so the list is quite, quite extensive. Uh, the symptoms um, vary um, from fatigue, muscle pain, muscle weakness, um, inflammatory uh, arthritis jo uh, with joint pain, uh, stiffness, uh, fevers, uh, patients develop uh, rashes, especially uh, triggered by sun, uh, ultraviolet exposure, um, hair loss, uh, oral and ulcers, uh, ulcers in the nose, uh, Raynaud's phenomenon, uh, phenomenon I'll, I'll explain that um, uh, in a few slides um, ahead, um, dryness in the eyes, dryness in the mouth, um, kidneys can be affected, that's one of the um, more severe complications of this condition. Uh, where patients develop inflammation in the kidneys, um, anemia, various types of uh, anemia, low blood counts, uh, low platelet counts. Uh, patients can develop blood clots, uh, blood clots in the legs, blood clots in the lung, pulmonary embolisms. Uh, patients also, uh, heart and lung can be affected in various ways. Uh, one of the most severe complications is when patients develop uh, inflammation in their brain, uh, which man can manifest with uh, psychosis, um, strokes, seizures, uh, and you know, one of the rare complications um, can be inflammation of the uh, GI tract, uh, inflammation of the intestines. And so this is just a graphic uh, representation of what we just talked about. Um, not gonna repeat myself here, but essentially, as you can see, uh, quite extensive uh, in terms of uh, what it can do um, to the body. So um, we, we're talking today about the systemic lupus. So I, I just wanted to make a quick distinction about systemic lupus um, and, and um, contrast that with discoid lupus, as well as uh, what's also known drug-induced lupus, which can present in two different forms, acute and subacute form. So the systemic lupus is, um, can involve uh, the organs we just talked about, manifest with those uh, various symptoms. The discoid lupus, it primarily involves uh, the skin. Patients develop um, uh, characteristic lesions on their skin. Oftentimes it's uh, on this effect in the scalp. Um, and the disease rarely uh, progresses to systemic form, to systemic lupus, uh, although it can, it can happen. Uh, we see it in probably about 10% uh, of patients uh, with discoid lupus. Um, the drug-induced lupus um, is, a, a, you know, an animal of its own, very different um, in terms of the, um, the disease course. However, the presentation uh, could be quite similar to the systemic lupus. So patients can present with typical lupus types rashes, they can present with fevers, joint inflammation, uh, but the, the trigger 
uh, is um, actually a medication. And I listed some of the um, most commonly implicated medications, um, blood pressure medication, hydralazine, antibiotic, um, minocycline, procanamide is a cardiac medication, um, TNF-alpha inhibitors, those are some of the medications we actually use for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and these medications can induce uh, uh, drug-induced lupus. And then there's the subacute form, uh, different types of medications um, can induce that. And this is, you know, just a, a few examples here, but the list is quite extensive. And, you know, every year we're finding more and more medications that can actually um, um, set off this reaction. Uh, this is some of the, um, uh, you know, pictures here uh, of what the cute skin manifestations of lupus um, um, you can see. So, um, Top left is the typical uh, Mailer rash, uh, what's also known as butterfly rash. Uh, it's, it's quite, um, it's interesting because it can, um, sometimes patients with rosacea, um, you know, they come to my office and they present from, let's say, a dermatologist office uh, and they report this rash on their face. But it's important to be able to differentiate the uh, butterfly malar rash that happens in lupus from rosacea or from uh, another condition, rheumatological condition called dermatomyositis can also cause a similar type rash. But it is in fact different in terms of what it looks like when it compared to the typical classic uh, uh, lupus rash. Uh, the top uh, right uh, shows uh, some exa examples of oral ulcers. Uh, the bottom right um, is a typical active acute uh, lupus rash affecting the, the hands. But uh, bottom, bottom left is actually the uh, discoid uh, lupus lesions uh, that I mentioned on the previous slide. So this patient um, probably doesn't have any uh, systemic manifestations, no other organs uh, involve, involvement, most likely just what you see um, on the chest. Uh, so this is the... Uh, Raynaud's phenomenon, I mentioned that is a, uh, often a very common manifestation uh, of lupus, although it's not specific for lupus at all. There are various other rheumatological conditions that can present uh, with Raynaud's phenomenon. Um, and generally, um, this is uh, from excessive uh, sensitivity of the receptors on the blood vessels that um, uh, lot, you know, that are, are in the fingers. And so they react usually to cold exposure. Um, but it's important to distinguish benign Raynaud's. So a lot of uh, people have uh, Raynaud's uh, because they have very sensitive receptors on their blood vessels and they react to cold. That doesn't mean that everyone who has Raynaud's has some sort of uh, rheumatological condition uh, like lupus. Um, uh, but we often do see Raynaud's um, in, in patients with uh, autoimmune connective tissue disorders like lupus. So it's important to look for other signs and symptoms uh, because Raynaud's alone would not make a diagnosis of lupus. Uh, what you see on the right um, is uh, called Chilblain's lupus. It's on, you see those little ulcers uh, on the toes. And again, that could be a manifestation of systemic lupus, uh, or it could very much be just a benign, uh, uh, benign presentation uh, the other name for it is perniosis, and that could be from exposure to the cold. So just a few words about the uh, epidemiology and demographics. So in the United States, uh, there's approximately 70 um, to 100 cases uh, of lupus per 100,000 um, uh, people. So for the whole population, there's about 300,000 people in the United States uh, who have lupus. Uh, women. Uh, are significantly overrepresented uh, compared to men, so a ratio of nine to one. Um, majority of patients um, are diagnosed with lupus um, between the age of 16 and 55. Um, so this is quite typical during the reproductive, you know, because again, I'm talking about women primarily, but during the reproductive, reproductive age. Uh, you know, 20% under the age of 16 and about 15% diagnosed later in life. Um, lupus is much more uh, prevalent in patients of African and Latin American descent. Um, 
let's talk about some of the uh, risk factors. Again, we don't know what, um, you know, what, what are the triggers, you know, what causes the disease. There's a lot of uh, factors um, that are constantly, uh, new factors are being fa found, uh, new mechanisms, uh, new genetic mutations. Uh, we know that, um, you know, list is quite extensive and we keep finding uh, new genetic mutations that can be responsible. Uh, that doesn't mean that everyone who has certain types of genetic mutations has lupus, but um, certain constellation of mutations, certain uh, other uh, environmental triggers can set off, um, can set off the, the onset of the disease, uh, can trigger the onset of the disease. Uh, we, we do know that there's a familial, familial factor to it. We know that uh, uh, patients who have um, first degree relatives uh, are at higher risk uh, of developing lupus. Um, there are certain hormonal um, risk factors, specifically estrogen has been uh, implicated as one of the risk factors. And that kind of goes back to, uh, to the previous slide uh, where I was talking about the the fact that lupus is much more common during the reproductive age when uh, women tend to produce a lot, a lot more estrogen. Uh, so the immune dysregulation, um, certainly a big part of lupus, uh, production of antibodies, uh, which then stimulate, stimulate the immune system in, in, in an abnormal way, uh, not in the way we would like the immune system to be stimulated uh, when let's say we are our body is attacked by a virus uh, or by bac bacteria. This is different. This is where the immune system goes into an overdrive and essentially attacks uh, attacks uh, the body without any um, uh, external um, uh, insult, uh, without any in in external invader, so to speak. Uh, the certain uh, viral infections like Epstein Barr. Um, uh, ultraviolet light, uh, that's one of the triggers, silica dust, um, tobacco, um, and then there are certain medications uh, that can also trigger um, uh, onset of lupus. Now, this is just, again, just a graphic representation of uh, what we just talked about. Uh, the immune system gets activated. There's formation of what's called immune, immune complexes. Antibodies are being produced. Uh, they drive production of these the cytokine, cytokine, which is signaling molecules. Um, the, the T cells, uh, part of the immune system, they get activated. And eventually all of this uh, immune response, abnormal immune response starts to um, attack um, our, our internal organs. So uh, some of the uh, laboratory testing that we do uh, when we look for, uh, when we see a patient, um, we, that we, who we are evaluating for uh, potential uh, diagnosis of lupus, uh, we'll look at these various um, autoantibodies. So specifically anti-nuclear antibodies, the, uh, which are not very specific, they're very sensitive, but they're not specific for lupus. The more specific antibodies are anti-double-stranded antibodies, anti-Smith, anti-phospholipid antibodies, we also look at uh, what's called complement levels, C3 and C4, as well as general uh, markers of inflammation, the um, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, as well as C-reactive protein. They're not specific for lupus again. They're simply markers of inflammation. They help in making the diagnosis. Uh, and then we also look for uh, kidney involvement. That's why we always evaluate urine. Uh, we we'll look for um, blood in the urine. We we'll look for protein in the urine. Uh, those are generally, should not be present. Um, otherwise, uh, um, obviously, there are other reasons why you might have blood in the urine. Um, uh, sometimes it's not obviously abnormal if a woman is menstruating, uh, but in general, protein um, is is not something that the kidney should be filtering out. Uh, so this is a slide that shows uh, the what's called the classification criteria for lupus. Um, there's been multiple classification diagnostic criteria for lupus. This was put out in 2019. There are quite complex. Um, so the, the, I'm not gonna go through this in, in detail. The, the one comment I want to make is that these criteria were primarily uh, developed um, to be used to include and exclude patients into the studies. They're really not truly designed uh, to be used for di diagnostic purposes when the patient is sitting in front of you um, in the office. However, 
Uh, we still use them. Um, we still look at all these different markers. We'll look at different symptoms. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, even though they are really designed to be used for uh, research purposes, they're still used um, to a certain extent in real life. But at the end of the day, how do you make the diagnosis? You know, the criteria are great to have, but, uh, you know, no one site, uh, you know, uh, fits all, you know, not everyone is the same. Uh, diseases, you know, we, we do this as a saying, diseases don't read the books, uh, everyone presents differently. Um, so at the end of the day, um, the diagnosis, uh, you know, is based, made by um, uh, experienced clinician, and it's based on their judgment. Uh, you look at the constellation of symptoms, um, in, in addition to physical exam findings, and then the lab parameters uh, that I uh, just discussed on the a few slides uh, prior. Um, and at the end of the day, um, even, you know, to make it, it's, it's never, it's, it's rare that you can make a, a, you can tell a patient, you know, this is 100%, it's lupus. Um, oftentimes, um, the diagnosis is not definite. Um, there could be what's called uh, undifferentiated connective tissue disease, or the other term for it is incomplete lupus, where the patient doesn't meet all the uh, criteria. Um, they might have uh, certain laboratory findings, um, but just not enough manifestations to make um, a diagnos diagnosis um, of definite lupus. So it's a lot of variability, variability in presentation, variability in terms of um, making a diagnosis and, and certainty in the diagnosis. So um, kind of nice segue into this next slide. Um, this is something that um, you know, we see a lot in our office. Uh, patients are referred often by a primary care physician or other subspecialists. Um, they, um, I, I'll use a, a quick scenario. They go to primary care physician. They do, uh, you know, they have certain symptoms, mm -hmm. non-specific symptoms, um, and they uh, tend, the primary care physician runs a lot of blood work. Um, they often uh, check uh, anti-nuclear antibodies. And lo and behold, the anti-nuclear antibodies uh, come back positive. And so that generally, um, triggers a rheumatology consult. So this patient comes uh, to my office uh, and then we have to make an I have to make an evaluation and determine uh, how significant um, uh, this positive blood work is. In other words, uh, does this patient have an underlying uh, rheumatological condition such as lupus? Now keep in mind this, this marker, the anti-nuclear antibodies, um, it's a very sensitive test but it's not specific. You can see this um, in a lot of, um, uh, in various rheumatological conditions. You can see this in uh, patients with um, dermatomyositis. You can see this in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. You can see this in patients with uh, Sjogren's disease. Those are other uh, rheumatological conditions, but you can also see it in non-rheumatological uh, non -rheumatological, uh, conditions. I've listed a few of them right in the middle of the slide. Uh, patients with multiple sclerosis uh, can have positive ANAs. Um, patients with infections, um, up to 30% uh, of people over 70 uh, years of age can uh, test positive for an ANA. Um, but what's important, um, the low, it's the, the, it's the uh, strength of the titer. You know, how positive is it? Um, in other words, if Patients often come with a very low positive ANA. I've listed the number uh, up on that slide, one to 40. And in fact, up to 30% of general population tests positive for one to 40 ANA. So it's very different when you see an uh, ANA of one to 40 versus ANA of one to 5,000. You know, your index of suspicion um, is much higher when you see a, you know, a much stronger ANA. Um, and, um, you know, the last note on this, uh, you know, on this topic, I would say, is that it's almost impossible to make a diagnosis um, of lupus with a negative ANA. Uh, there's certain uh, rare uh, circumstances where that um, can be done, uh, but majority of patients, overwhelming majority of patients um, diagnosed with lupus will have a positive ANA. But then the flip side, not everyone who has the uh, positive ANA um, has lupus. So, um, uh, what, what, what are uh, some of the conditions that can uh, present in a similar fashion uh, like lupus? Uh, 
Uh, I've mentioned a few uh, from who we talked about on the previous slide, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, dermatomyositis, systemic sclerosis. Um, so those are some of the rheumatological conditions that um, can uh, overlap in terms of uh, manifestations, in terms of, in ter uh, in terms of their uh, presentation. Um, but then there are other non-rheumatological conditions like systemic infections, multiple sclerosis, even cancers. They can all mimic, um, mimic lupus, systemic lupus. So some of the you know, general uh, management uh, uh, principles, um, certainly in patients who have lupus, uh, there's always a recommendation to avoid, avoid uh, excessive um, ultraviolet light exposure, sun exposure, and whenever there are uh, patients in the sun to apply um, high quality, high count SPF, at least 50 or above, because these patients tend to be, avoid the sun a lot, um, uh, uh, they often uh, lack, uh, their vitamin D level is uh, usually on the lower side. So we always recommend uh, vitamin D supplementation, you know, beyond what you get in the diet, uh, just uh, due to the fact that they're not getting enough sun exposure. Uh, we recommend avoiding uh, drugs that contain sulfa. Uh, that tends to be uh, a trigger for uh, lupus flares. Uh, and then um, estrogen. Um, you know, we talked about estrogen earlier. Um, we usually recommend avoiding high estrogen oral contraceptive um, uh, pills, uh, but rather uh, steer patients to, uh, towards uh, progesterone, progesterone only contraception. Uh, a few other things, uh, avoiding echinacea, alfalfa sprouts, um, and certainly smoking. Smoking tends to, um, um, you know, besides you know, smoking being, you know, deleterious to, you know, anybody's health, um, it tends to um, uh, make the disease potentially, make the, the course of the disease uh, tougher. It can um, interfere with the um, efficacy of certain medications uh, that we use for lupus. Uh, so not good. Uh, but what about um, medical therapy? Uh, how do we treat lupus? And the treatment is uh, the treatment approach is quite variable. And, and what does it depend on? It depends on the um, severity of the disease. It depends on the organ involvement. Um, and um, obviously there are certain basic medications, uh, milder medications that we use for lupus. Um, and uh, the therapy would potentially uh, need to be escalated if the disease is still uncontrolled. I've listed um, this quite a extensive list of medications that we now have available for lupus. Not all of these medications are technically lupus only medications. Uh, they're used for other conditions, but over the past um, 10, 15 years, we've actually had some medications approved specifically for lupus. So hydroxychloroquine, I'm sure everyone has heard quite a bit of hydroxychloroquine uh, for all the wrong reasons uh, back in the uh, beginning of the pandemic. Uh, when it was um, unsuccessfully um, tried as a therapy for COVID, uh, but it's been used for a lupus. It's one of our, our uh, mildest medications. Uh, we've used it for for many decades, um, and it's it's a it's a base medication for lupus. In other words, pretty much every patient who has a diagnosis of lupus and has certain even mildest manifestations should be on hydroxychloroquine. Generally treats skin, joint involvement, uh, and it also has some uh, mild anti-clotting effect, uh, blood thinner effect. Uh, Benlista, uh, the generic name is Volumumab. That's a newer medication for lupus. So we use it uh, also for skin and joint involvement and recently approved for kidney involvement. Uh, Anafrolumab, was a medication that was approved um, earlier this year, um, also for skin and joint uh, disease. Voclosporin also was approved last year uh, for kidney involvement. Uh, the uh, medications you know, listed lower, those are older medications that are not technically lupus uh, exclusive medications, but used primarily in lupus. And all the way at the bottom, um, kind of stuck that in there, uh, although in red, so you see steroids. Steroids um, is um, unfortunately, because we didn't have a lot of therapies for lupus, because especially in the severe cases, 
Um, steroids uh, was were always the go-to and still are a go-to, depending on the situation, depending on how acute the presentation is. We do use um, steroids to you know, a fairly uh, um, substantial, um, um, really, really substantially, but to a lot a lesser extent, I would say over the past several years because of availability of some of these other therapies. Uh, but we do use steroids, um, especially in, in the initial stages when we need to suppress the inflammation uh, and, and try to get the disease under control. Uh, okay. So, um, but steroids carry um, um, a ton of side effects. Um, very, very toxic, especially uh, when used over the long, over a very uh, uh, a long term. So, I, I, here I've essentially uh, listed, you know, the reasons why we use the steroids. Um, just I, already, I just talked about that, um, but uh, the side effects, um, you know, there's there's a number of side number of side effects, and and they're uh, quite debilitating, especially when used in, in higher doses over a long period of time. Uh, the, list of, uh, the list is uh, quite extensive. Uh, weight gain, um, it can cause uh, steroid-induced um, diabetes. It can worsen the underlying diabetes, elevated blood pressure, cholesterol. Uh, it can worsen the um, uh, bone loss. It can uh, cause osteopenia, osteoporosis. Um, it can worsen, you know, the uh, eye health, the glaucoma, cataracts. Um, uh, psychologically, uh, patients become more irritable. Uh, mood swings, uh, as, as bad as uh, psychosis, um, can cause muscle weakness. Um, the big thing is immunosuppression. Um, uh, steroids will further suppress immune system. The purpose of steroids, obviously, is to suppress. Um, the infl inflammatory state, so um, to get the disease under control, but at the same time, they will suppress the immune system, and, and that will expose the patient to various, um, various infections. Um, osteonecrosis, um, it, can, it can cause gastritis, it can cause, can cause stomach ulcers, um, uh, skin thinning, uh, bruising, acne, um, certain cardiac uh, manifestations, uh, patients can go, uh, can feel uh, palpitations, but they can also go uh, develop certain types of arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation. Let's talk about uh, prognosis. Uh, so uh, the five-year survival rate um, has increased tremendously uh, since the 1950s. As you can see, uh, it used to be 40%, uh, now it's, uh, up to 90% in 1990s, and that's again, 1990s. That's you know, 30 years ago. So that that the even um, we don't have more recent epidemiological studies, you know, uh, but I suspect that number is uh, even higher than that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's still ranked among the top 20 causes of death, especially in women between ages uh, five and 64. Uh, I've listed some of the poor prognostic factors. Um, you know, being a male with lupus. Um, you know, even though uh, men are uh, significantly underrepresented, uh, you know, developing uh, lupus as a male happens to be a poor prognostic factor. Uh, developing lupus uh, at young age, uh, being an African American, um, kidney involvement, um, having underlying uh, high blood pressure, uh, as well as having the, what's called antiphospholipid antibodies. I'll touch upon that in the next uh, few slides. What are some of the causes of death in lupus? And here I kind of broke it up into two parts. So in the early stages of the disease, patients who uh, have most severe manifestations of lupus at presentation, patients who have um, brain involvement, inflammation on the brain, uh, strokes, uh, seizures, patients who develop um, kidney involvement, lupus, that's called lupus nephritis. Um, uh, those, those patients are at highest risk uh, of death in the initial stages. But the, the big thing here, the standout is again, uh, infections, uh, opportunistic infections, um, viral infections, bacterial infections, fungal infections. And, and why are these patients um, so um, predisposed to these infections? That's because they are severely immunosuppressed. And the, why they're so severely immunosuppressed is because we, try, we are trying to um, control the disease. We're trying to um, 
uh, uh, suppress the inf inflammation. Uh, in the more, more established disease, you know, five to 10 years out, um, um, patients with lupus carry significantly increased risk of uh, developing cardiovascular disease. Um, so at, at least on average 10 years um, earlier uh, than the um, average healthy, ad uh, healthy adult. Uh, and then there's an increased risk of malignancy, specifically the um, HPV uh, positive cervical cancer. So what are the uh, what are some of the um, uh, some of the comorbidities? You know, some some of the other health uh, related manifestations that kind of flow out of lupus. So osteoporosis. Um, certainly, these patients um, are at higher risk of osteoporosis, often due to the, um, uh, prolonged use of steroids. Uh, similarly, avascular necrosis, osteonecrosis, um, that usually affects the um, uh, femur bone uh, in the, the hip bone, uh, kidney failure, uh, because especially those patients who develop uh, lupus involvement in the kidney, um, they um, uh, occasionally end up um, uh, losing their kidney function. They end up on hemodialysis, uh, and that in and of itself there is uh, you know, significant uh, health disability. Cardiovascular disease, as I just mentioned before, uh, patients often have uh, a lot of fatigue, uh, and then cognitive, cognitive dysfunction. Cognitive dysfunction, which includes uh, psychosis, depression, um, let's see, well, oh, uh, just a few um, notes here on uh, you know, some pregnancy considerations. Uh, specifically wanna to touch upon that, again, because majority of patients with lupus are um, women of childbearing age, um, so, this often com comes up uh, when I see patients with lupus, uh, women want to get pregnant. Um, sometimes they uh, present with acute lupus when they are pregnant. So the big you know, rule of thumb is to um, re advise women not to get pregnant if their disease is still in the active stage. Uh, the preference is that uh, disease is um, uh, stable for at least six months. Um, the uh, certain types of antibodies, um, specifically the SSA and SSB antibodies, they portend a, uh, an elevated risk of arrhythmia of what's called a heart block, not in the, in the mother, but rather in the fetus while the mother is you know, pregnant, obviously. Uh, so it's about 2%. Uh, they also um, increase the risk of what's called neonatal lupus. Um, and so it's important you know, when, to recognize uh, that we often see these patients, uh, these patients are referred to us from uh, their um, OBGYNs or from maternal fetal medicine when they test positive for these antibodies. And the more recent recommendation is to actually treat these, these patients um, with hydroxychloroquine. So this is a patient that has no diagnosis of lupus, simply tested positive for uh, these antibodies. Uh, and in order to decrease the risk of uh, heart block in, in, the, in the fetus, uh, their recommendation is to treat these women prophylactically during pregnancy with hydroxychloroquine. Uh, women who have lupus, um, the recommendation is to um, start them on baby aspirin and that's to decrease the risk of preeclampsia. Um, in terms of the safety of medications uh, in, in women uh, who have lupus and are pregnant, hydroxychloroquine is a safe medication. We always continue it through um, the whole pregnancy. Uh, the NSAIDs, um, the Advil, ibuprofen, naproxen, Aleve, generally safe, um, but uh, not after the 30th week of pregnancy. Um, steroids, uh, again, we do resort to use of steroids, uh, so they're okay to be used, but we prefer to uh, keep the dose under 10 milligrams. Uh, Azathioprine is also okay to use. Some of the medications that are um, can be harmful uh, to the fetus, uh, mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, leflunamide, methotrexate. And then the um, last but not least, those are some of the newer medications that we use for lupus, the biologic medications. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, much data on them. As far as their safety, there are registries available uh, where they're uh, continuing looking at women who are on these medications while pregnant. But right now there's uh, um, 
we, we don't have a recommendation. We don't know, you know, is it safe to keep these women, uh, to keep women on these medications while they're pregnant? It really all comes down to the severity of their disease. If, they're, if their life, uh, you know, is in danger, then you have to treat, treat them. Um, what are the, some of the pregnancy outcomes in uh, women with lupus? Uh, certainly the, the risk of flare uh, is increased in someone who has an uh, active disease while being pregnant, someone who has uh, involvement in their kidneys, and uh, let's say a woman who's pregnant but has been, um, not, uh, has been off hydroxychloroquine, not using hydroxychloroquine, the very basic medication for lupus. So, uh, you know, those, those women are certainly at higher risk of flare-up uh, during pregnancy. Uh, in terms of preterm uh, births, um, 15 to 50, depending on the study, 15 to 50 percent of uh, um, births are preterm in women with lupus. The strongest risk factors are, again, kidney disease and uh, active disease while being pregnant. Um, the fetal loss, uh, again, again, the uh, the rates are much higher compared to you know healthy healthy adults, healthy pregnant adults, 17 percent. Uh, risk factors again, active disease, essentially very very similar. Uh, here, another risk factor is antiphospholipid antibodies, uh, and then 10 to 30 percent of pregnancies, uh, the 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 baby um, uh, has what's called intrauterine growth uh, retard uh, restriction. Um, uh, so the antiphospholipid antibodies, I've mentioned uh, uh, these antibodies a few times during my talk. Uh, these, these antibodies uh, are important uh, because they um, can uh, induce uh, miscarriages. They can induce what's called a blood, uh, blood clots in the placenta and then uh, cause the miscarriage. Uh, further on, you know, e even further, women with lupus who have these antibodies uh, can develop strokes, they can develop blood clots, blood clot in the leg, blood clot in the lung. And so I'm not gonna go through this in detail, uh, but I've listed some of the recommendations depending on what, um, uh, what uh, the, the symptoms they, they've had um, prior to the pregnancy and how we usually treat, uh, treat these women while they're pregnant. But aspirin is the mainstay um, of therapy for someone who's got the um, antiphospholipid, antiphospholipid uh, antibodies present. Um, and uh, almost at the end here, uh, just a few kind of uh, additional notes uh, on breastfeeding. So certainly uh, okay to use uh, hydroxychloroquine, prednisone, um, biologic medications uh, are okay. Um, a few others are not okay. It's essentially the same medications that are not okay to be, uh, to be on during pregnancy uh, that are harmful to the fetus. But they are the same medications that um, should not be used during um, breastfeeding. Uh, in terms of uh, in vitro fertilization and certain assisted reproductive technology uh, technologies, again, um, the recommendation is not to attempt those uh, while the disease is active. Uh, and there's certainly caution in, in uh, patients with antiphospholipid antibodies, especially with history of um, previous clotting events, like miscarriages, strokes, or, or blood clots. Um, and then in terms of birth control, um, again, we talked about estrogen, um, you know, plays a major role here. Um, we generally recommend avoiding estrogen-containing contraception and steer the patient towards uh, uh, progesterone-only uh, containing um, either uh, IUD, as that's a preferred method, um, and then uh, the second, you know, method, is second uh, option is the progestin-only pill. Uh, so this is a summary slide. I'm just going to kind of go through and list a few things here that we talked about. We talked about the definitions of systemic lupus, uh, the clinical uh, manifestations, uh, organ involvement, um, demographics and epidemiology. Uh, we talked about some of the risk factors and uh, predispositions, uh, how we make the diagnosis, how we manage the patients, um, what the prognosis is, the causes of death, uh, co, you know, comorbidities and uh, various pregnancy considerations. Uh, and that is the end. I will now open it up to uh, comments, questions. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Zuckerman. Um, so at this time, I'd just like to remind everyone at home to uh, go ahead and send in any questions that you might have. Um, we do have some questions that have already come in, so we're just gonna dive right into them.
Um, the first one, I have been diagnosed with soft lupus and told I need to be tested for small fiber neuropathy. Um, what, I guess, if, can you explain what soft lupus and small fiber neuropathy are? So I'm not sure what soft lupus means. I don't really know. I can only, I suspect soft lupus maybe means um, incomplete lupus or maybe the patient doesn't have um, enough manifestations to make a full diagnosis of lupus. I suspect that's, you know, uh, the other the other term I've heard is uh, patients come and they say, I, I was told I have a touch of lupus. So, you know, mm. kind of a, a slang, I guess, for incomplete lupus, you know, they have uh, probably um, anti-nuclear antibodies, um, uh, but uh, no other typical classic manifestations of lupus. Um, and, and so I suspect in this particular situation, a patient is diagnosed with small fiber neuropathy, uh, which is not necessarily a typical manifestation of lupus. We do see it in other rheumatological conditions, not, 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 not common at all. Um, it can be seen particularly in patients with Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, but uh, so, so I'm not sure how to tie it into, uh, into lupus number one, um, but I suspect that um, this patient probably doesn't have, um, you know, typical manifestations of lupus. So therefore the diagnosis of lupus was never definitive. Okay. Um... Yeah, they didn't, they didn't specify. Yeah, so, but so. then, but to, just to answer the question directly, I would say um, I don't normally see small fiber neuropathy in the context of, of lupus. I do see it in the context of, you know, other rheumatological conditions like Sjogren's disease. Got it. Okay. So um, the next question is, what are some of the side effects for of hydro... I'm sorry, I'm going to- Hydroxychloroquine, right. Thank you. So hydroxy, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, so uh, kind of goes hand in hand. So it's a relatively uh, mild medication in both senses. It's, it's mild in terms of its efficacy. So it's, it's not the strongest medication and it's fairly mild in terms of its side effects and, and it's safe. Uh, so, so let's put it, it's not going to treat a very severe lupus and it's not gonna cause very severe side effects. So that's a, a general statement, right? So, and, and the more specific answer, um, occasionally when the patients first start the medication, they can develop a bit of nausea. Uh, when they uh, start the medication tends to improve. Um, rarely so, um, patients can uh, develop some uh, hyperpigmentation on their skin, uh, hyperpigmentation on their gums, like darkening. Um, there is a very low risk uh, of what's called a QT prolongation. So it's a um, abnormality in certain uh, heart rhythm. Um, very rare, we don't see it. We just have to be aware of that. If, if a patient is also uh, on another medication that can cause certain type of arrhythmia. Uh, really the big thing that we always talk to patients about um, is uh, a very remote uh, risk. And, and when it does happen, it, it happens decades after the use of the medication, uh, what's called uh, retinopathy, uh, bullseye retinopathy. Uh, this is damage to the back of the eye. Um, and again, it happens in, according to the studies, from you know, 5 to 10% of patients. And when we do see it, these are patients who have been on the medication for 20 to 30 years. Um, so this is not something that would develop right away. Um, and for that reason, uh, when I start a patient on a hydroxychloroquine, I always ask them to see an ophthalmologist for baseline examination, uh, not so much to see if hydroxychloroquine has caused anything. So as you start the medication and I tell them, you know, within the next, uh, you know, two, three months, see an ophthalmologist just to make sure you don't have any pre-existing retinal um, issues. And then I, uh, generally the guideline is to then see the ophthalmologist in five years uh, and after that, on a yearly basis, just uh, and they do certain types of testing. Uh, they look at the retina at the back of the eye to see if uh, there's any manifestations. But um, honestly, we, we rarely, almost never see this, um, this complication. And, and then, you know, obviously the basic thing is just like any medication, uh, hydroxychloroquine can cause an acute allergic reaction. 
but that's you know not really a side effect that that can you know, nothing specific to hydroxychloroquine. I've seen it, uh, but this can happen with any medication. You know, acute um, rash and uh, fevers, um, you know, which usually resolves uh, either with discontinuation of the drug, um, plus or minus uh, use of some steroids, um, just to knock it out. Okay, um, and autoimmune disorders and COVID. Um, any any connections? It's a good question. Um, the simple answer, I don't know, um, but um, everything is so new. Uh, we we're uh, finding more and more um, cases. And at this point, these are all cases and case, you know, case reports uh, where uh, patients present with new onset, new development of autoimmune conditions. Um, so I've seen a few cases. I haven't seen a, a case of classic lupus, um, you know, associated with, uh, you know, post COVID infection. Uh, certainly we see uh, exacerbations, flare ups of underlying lupus. That's not, it's, it's rare, uh, but certainly more common than something uh, like a de novo, you know, a brand new onset of lupus, uh, which would be attributed to a recent COVID infection. But I, there's definitely been some case reports and not just lupus, but other autoimmune conditions as well. Great. Um, next question. Um, are there any dietary changes that are most helpful for those with lupus besides avoiding alfalfa sprouts? Um, in general, um, there's really nothing specific for lupus. Uh, however, I would say um, from the inflammatory perspective, um, I'll kind of a more of a general answer. Uh, we know that there are certain foods that tend to be pro-inflammatory and certain foods that tend to be anti-inflammatory. And again, this is not you know, specific to lupus, uh, but uh, in general, things like um, uh, sugar, um, red meat, uh, they tend to be pro-inflammatory. Um, so I generally recommend, you know, in that sense, um, you know, limiting the, in, uh, you know, those types of foods in their diet. Whereas on the flip side, Omega-3 fish intake um, tends to be, tends to have an anti-inflammatory effect. But again, not, not a, um, a lupus specific answer. Uh, vitamin, vitamin D though, uh, you know, tends to be um, something we do recommend. Uh, it does, um, you know, besides the fact that patients with lupus, because they have avoid the sun, they usually lack, um, uh, uh, you know, natural vitamin D uh, from the sun. Um, th there's also been some recent research looking into vitamin D supplementation and autoimmune conditions. Um, not a lot of good quality data, um, you know, recommending, I, I can't go, uh, I can't tell you outright that I would say, you know, use vitamin D and you will, you know, suppress inflammation or you'll avoid lupus, uh, but it certainly doesn't, uh, um, doesn't hurt to, you know, have adequate vitamin D supplementation. Uh, but at best, I would say the, the data is fairly weak. You know, it, it's positive, but it's weak. It's not, there's nothing, I wouldn't make a strong recommendation for vitamin D. I think that that's a question, upcoming question. Yeah. So the question was, um, are there any other supplements that will help ease the symptoms of SLE? Oh, other supplements. Yeah. Um, um, no, not, nothing, nothing really um, um, out there that has, has shown, shown to be, uh, you know, effective, you know, in the, in a control setting. Okay. Um, and I'm just looking over at the chat and then the question is, is IVIG infusion used for lupus? IVIG is generally not used in lupus. Okay. Uh, IVIG is used in lupus off-label in extremely rare situations. Um, in other words, it's not uh, something that's um, approved or used what's called on-label um, for lupus. I've used it. I've used it in very specific situations um, where patients have certain life-threatening manifestations of lupus, um, specifically um, Antiphospholipid uh, antibodies uh, that manifest in, in uh, let's say, um, 
bleeding um, in the lung, you know, excessive bleeding in the lung. Uh, patients can develop what's called diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. So that's very uncontrolled bleeding in the lung. Um, so the, long, the, the short answer is um, we don't really use it. Um, it. It can be used as kind of a, uh, you know, kitchen sink approach, you know, when you've tried a lot of different things, then you kind of, you don't know what else to use. And uh, in certain situations, IVIG can be used. Uh, but as far as, um, you know, in the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of cases, you, you wouldn't use IVIG. Okay. Um, and then you had mentioned that audio, autoimmune suppressed people are more prone to fungal disease. Um, is there any way to prevent that? Well, um, the, I guess the, the only way to prevent any type of infection is, uh, you know, specifically fungal infection. Uh, I'm not sure how you would prevent the fungal infection. We know how you can prevent, you know, various other infections. You, you want to be appropriately immunized uh, against, you know, various viral infections against certain bacterial infections. So that's definitely a recommendation. Fungal infection, um, you know, other than certain precautions. Um, and I think the overriding theme is the less immunosuppression that the patient is on, the lower their risk is. But that is uh, not always, um, you know, not always possible. Patients uh, require to be on um, certain immunosuppressive drugs because their disease is uncontrolled. The big push, the big push over the past, I would say, 10 years has been, and, and that's especially with its newer therapies becoming available, is to uh, try to reduce the use of steroids because steroids tend to um, certainly elevate the risk of immunosuppression and therefore uh, increase the risk of um, infections. And so these, these newer therapies, although they are um, some of them are immunosuppressive. Uh, they they um, um, certainly work better than they're more you know more um, uh, specific for lupus. Um, they take to, they tend to work better, um, and then you avoid other you know dreaded complications of steroids. Uh, but in terms of immunosuppression, the less immunosuppression you're on, certainly the, the lower the risk of infections. Um, for um, and, and again, with viral and bacterial infections, there are certain immunizations that are available um, to you know, general population, but we do immunize uh, patients with autoimmune conditions, specifically lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, who are on immunosuppressive therapies. We do immunize these patients uh, much more aggressively than we would, uh, let's say someone, you know, a healthy adult uh, who's not immunosuppressed and does not have an autoimmune condition. Okay, got it. Um, and it looks like I've got one more question here. Um, if you're diagnosed with lupus, um, can you continue use of Synthroid? Sure. Uh, you know, there's nothing, no contraindication um, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, use of Synthroid. Uh, in fact, um, hypothyroidism, low thyroid, autoimmune thyroid disease, uh, you can often coexist in patients uh, with lupus. Uh, I'm not going to say that one triggers the other, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a common co uh, condition that we see in patients uh, with lupus. And um, overwhelming majority of these patients are on levothyroxine, uh, which is Synthroid, the brand name. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, so I would like to thank you, Dr. Zuckerman, for um, presenting to us this evening. Um, My pleasure.